There is a need to change the perception of physical and mental disabilities through this spirit of adventure, and would he congratulate them on the work that they do? Well, I most certainly would congratulate them on the work they do, and I am very positive about disability in the armed forces, and I appoint the Honourable Lady to the Diversity and Inclusion Strategy uh, published earlier, which sets out the blueprint for how we can do much better going forward. Uh, but I'd be more than happy to meet with the charity that she has cited, and I congratulate them on the work that they do. I commit to Tobias Elwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The integrated view states that China poses a complex, systematic challenge. But we recently learned that RAF veterans have been lured to China to assist them with their own Air Force training. And today, my, the reply to my written parliamentary question confirms that Chinese officer cadets have recently been attending courses at Sandhurst, Trivenham, and Cranwell. So, could the Secretary of State confirm that we will update our security strategy towards China? And will the law be changed to prevent former RAF pilots from being recruited by the Chinese military? Uh, Mr Speaker, it's a couple of days since I signed off the uh, response to Rajiv Mandel's question, but from memory it was a few years ago, albeit within the five that his question referred to. Um, there are, we have revised our policy around Chinese attendance on key courses since, but it's important to note that in none of those courses is anything taught or compromised that might be above the threshold for the Official Secrets Act. Mr Speaker, does the Secretary of State recall in this remembrance period the two very constructive meetings held by the War Widows Association with our honourable friend for Aldershot when he was Veterans Minister on those people two to three hundred people who lost their widow's pension on remarriage and will the progress made towards an ex gratia payment for that small cohort now rapidly be brought to a conclusion? Yes, thank you to my right honourable friend. I am acutely aware of the position of war widows, the pre-2015 war, war widows. The, the Treasury is absolutely against retrospection. That has been the case over, over consecutive governments, but ex gratia payments are um, a, a different matter. And I can tell him that I cannot give any commitments, but the matter is under active consideration. Hello, Morgan. Speaker. On Friday, I was honoured to visit the brand new Specialist Veterans Orthopaedic Centre at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Hospital in Gaboria, New Oswestry. It is going to be a world class facility built to provide NHS care for veterans across the UK, as well as working with military char charities to provide other support. Would the Secretary of State, State join with me in congratulating them on their achievement and also agree to looking at extending those centres across the UK? Yes, look, I, I, I think that achievement, the marrying up that's gone over the, over the years between MOD, the health service and the charities has gone from strength to strength. And I think the example that the Honourable Lady has used is something that we should embrace and do more of. Robert Court. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, will the IR refresh include uh, consideration of the resilience of the RF's main operating bases, particularly dispersal? Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend knows well that whilst the RAF main operating bases are incredible centres of excellence uh, for the aircraft that they operate, uh, there do indeed need to be well rehearsed plans for dispersing the Air Force across civil, uh, civilian airfields around the country, and indeed the RAF is developing and refining those plans as we speak. Right, that completes questions. I'll let the front benches go. Okay. I understand that there is a prospect of legal proceedings in relation to the centre at Manston. In any event, given the national importance of the issues raised by this case, I am allowing members to discuss those issues, but I would ask members not to discuss the details of any legal proceedings which might come underway. We now start the urgent question. Sir Roger Gale. Mr Speaker, may I ask the Minister of State for the Home Department? What steps he is being he is taking to reduce the overcrowding at the Manston Asylum Processing Facility, and also could he make a statement about the safeguarding of minors, both at Manston and in hotels? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have set out on multiple occasions the global migration crisis is playing an unprecedented strain on our asylum system. Despite what they may have been told by many, 
Migrants who travel through safe countries should not put their lives at risk by making the dangerous and illegal journey to the United Kingdom. We're steadfast in our determination to tackle those gaming the system and will use every tool at our disposal to deter illegal migration and disrupt the business model of people smugglers. So far this year, our French colleagues have prevented over 29,000 crossings and destroyed over 1,000 boats. Furthermore, my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, will be speaking with President Macron this week about how together we can achieve our shared ambition to prevent further crossings. Some 40,000 people have crossed the Channel on small boats so far this year, and the Government continues to have a statutory responsibility to provide safe and secure accommodation for asylum seekers who would otherwise be destitute. In order to meet that responsibility, we have had to keep people for longer than we would have liked at our processing facility at Manston. But we have been sourcing more bed spaces with local authorities and in contingency accommodation, such as hotels. I can tell the House that as of 8 a.m. this morning, the population at the Manston facility was back below 1,600. This is a significant reduction from this point last week, with over 2,300 people being placed in onward accommodation. Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank my Border Force officers, members of the Armed Forces, our contractors and Home Office staff who have worked tirelessly to help achieve this reduction. Before the high number of arrivals in September, Manston had proven to be a streamlined and efficient asylum processing centre, where biographic and biometric details are taken and assessed against our databases, asylum claims registered and the vulnerable assessed. We are determined to ensure that Manston is back to that position as soon as possible, and I am encouraged by the progress now being made. We must not be complacent. We remain absolutely focused on addressing these complex issues so that we can deliver a fair and effective asylum system that works in the interests of the British people. Sir Roger Gale. Mr Speaker, may I first thank my right hon. Friend for the endeavours that he has made since his appointment um, to reduce the numbers of people overcrowding the Manston facility. Uh -huh. This was, I believe, a problem wholly avoidable and my right hon. Friend has worked tirelessly with, I should say, and I thank, him, thank them also, the staff at Manston who have done a superb job under very difficult circumstances. Um, Mr Speaker, we are now nearly back to where we need to be with the Manston Processing Centre operating efficiently. Will my right hon. Friend confirm his understanding, shared with the Home Secretary with me last Thursday when she visited the site, that Manston is a processing centre and not accommodation centre. Would he therefore agree with me that the temporary facilities that were erected while he and I were both there present a week ago on Sunday will be demolished? And can he confirm that additional accommodation will be provided so that the spike in November, which is anticipated and which will happen as it happened last year, will be catered for so that we won't have a repetition of the clogging up of the facilities at Manston? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, can I first uh, praise my uh, honourable friend, who is an exemplary member of Parliament, and it's been my privilege to work alongside him over the last 10 days. He has consistently raised concerns of his constituents, but also our joint desire that Manson operates as a humane and decent facility that provides compassionate care to those who arrive at the United Kingdom's borders. The population is now back at an acceptable level, and that is a considerable achievement. It's essential that it remains so, and he's right to say that the challenge is far from over. Last month, for a variety of reasons, November proved to be the largest uh, month of the year for arrivals to the UK, and so we have to be aware of that and to plan appropriately. We're doing just that. We are ensuring that there is now further accommodation so that we can build up a sufficient buffer so that those arriving at Manston stay there for the legal period of 24 hours or thereabouts and then are swiftly moved to better and more appropriate accommodation elsewhere in the country. I support his view that Manston should 
always be a processing centre, not a permanent home for migrants arriving in the UK. I'll take note of his comment that he would like the temporary uh, facilities there to be dismantled. I don't think that that is possible right now because the prudent thing is to ensure that we maintain the level of infrastructure we have in case there's a significant increase in the number of migrants arriving in the weeks ahead. But it's certainly not mine or the Home Secretary's intent intention that Manson is turned into a permanent site for housing migrants. Senator Minister Stephen Kidd. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to his place. The Home Secretary has stated that after 12 years of Conservative government, the asylum system is broken. Well, we agree, Mr Speaker, and it's the party opposite that has broken it. The government is processing just half the number of asylum claims that they were in 2015, and as, as a result, the British taxpayer is footing a £7 million hotel bill every single day. Their failure to replace the Dublin Agreement on returning failed asylum seekers, failure to crack down on the criminal gangs, and failure to get agreement with France are also increasing the backlog. This catalogue of chaos has led to the overcrowding in Manston, which the member for, Honourable Member for North Thanet has blamed directly on the Home Secretary. Now, the former Home Secretary revealed today that on the 20th of October he received legal advice that Manston was being used or in danger of being used as a detention centre, and he took emergency measures to work within the law. However, the current Home Secretary met with officials on the 19th of October, just before she was forced to resign for breaching the ministerial code. Can the Minister please confirm that she refused to take those same emergency measures? Yeah. And can he explain why she ignored the advice she was repeatedly given over a period of several weeks? The Home Secretary told this House just a week ago that she did not ignore legal advice. Can the Minister tell the House now whether he believes that statement to be correct? Mm -hmm. Now, the key question on Manston is whether legal advice was followed or not. Given the Minister's unlawful approval of a Tory donor's housing project in his previous brief, is he really best placed to make that judgment? And finally, Mr Speaker, we know that 222 children have gone missing from asylum accommodation. What is the government doing to find the missing children, to prevent more children from going missing and to meet its legal obligations to vulnerable children? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, for a few moments then, I thought that the honourable gentleman was going to approach this in an intelligent and constructive manner. Sadly, Mr Speaker, that was the triumph of optimism over experience. In fact, the Labour Party are trying to politicise this. And we can, of course, say the same. The Labour Party have no plan to tackle illegal immigration. They don't want to tackle illegal immigration. The Labour Party left the system in ruins in 2010, as my right honourable friend, the member for Ashford, would attest, who had to help to pick up those pieces. We believe in a system of secure borders, and a fair and robust asylum system that all members of the public can have confidence in. He asks about the Home Secretary's conduct, and let me tell him, the Home Secretary has consistently approved hotel accommodation. More than 30 hotels have been brought online in the time that my rightable friend has been in office, and that has ensured that thousands of asylum seekers have been able to move on from the Manston site and into better and more sustainable accommodation. And look at her record over the course of the last week. The population at Manston has fallen from 4,000 individuals to 1,600 in the matter of seven days. That is a very considerable achievement by the Home Secretary, by her officials in the Home Office, and I am proud of that. Ray McKinley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be very aware uh, that previous student accommodation of Christchurch University has been uh, taken up, uh, 86 rooms, uh, by the company called Clear Springs, uh, one of many outsourced companies that are uh, around the country trying to find accommodation. 
uh, he may also be aware uh, that Thanet District Council had been in correspondence with the Home Office in August, saying how unsuitable this site could possibly be because of its close proximity, a few hundred yards from both primary and secondary schools and in a residential area. Is it not the case that these outsourced companies like Clear Springs and Serco are simply running roughshod over planning consents, local authorities and, and local consultation? I'm very concerned at this example, uh, and it must be that the Home Office get involved when these large sites are selected, rather than these big outsourced companies just doing as they please. Well, my honourable friend and I have been in contact over the weekend about this issue, and I know how strongly he feels. My first duty has been to ensure that Manston can operate in a legal and decent manner, and we are well on the way to achieving that. The second task is ensuring that the Home Office and its contractors procure accommodation, whether that be hotels, spot bookings or other forms of accommodation, in a sensible manner where we take into account many of the things that my honourable friend has just described, safeguarding, the impact on the local community and the likelihood of disorder, whether or not there is already significant uh, pressure on that community, whether it is a tourist hotspot, and many other factors, and those criteria need to be followed carefully. And my third priority beyond that is clearly exiting us from this hotel strategy altogether. It is not sustainable for the country to be spending billions of pounds a year on hotels. We need to move now rapidly to a point where individuals are processed swiftly, so the backlog in cases falls, that we disperse people fairly around the UK to local authority and private rental sector accommodation where appropriate, and we also look as to whether there are other larger sites that might be available that provide decent but not luxurious accommodation so we don't create a further pull factor to the UK. SNP spokesperson Stuart Seymour. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also congratulate the Honourable Member for his uh, UQ and for his persistent scrutiny of these issues? But surely, Mr Speaker, we have now reached a point where the Home Office can no longer be left with responsibility for the safety of these children. Hundreds are missing. Thousands more are stuck in hotels outside the child protection system. Children are reportedly pressurised to claim to be adults and increasingly misidentified as adults. There have been harrowing accounts of assault and rape, general evidence of fear and depression, and adults are not even being properly disclosed or checked. Mr. Speaker. So can we have a cross-government task force headed by the Prime Minister and is tasked with getting children into local authority care instead of into more hotels? Mr Speaker, progress in moving people out of Manston is welcome, but it does beg the massive question, why wasn't that possible last month? And to help the Minister free up accommodation, Mr Speaker, will he prioritise the outstanding claims of 15,000 or so Syrians and Afghans who should be comparatively easy to identify <laughs> as refugees and award their status? And will he suspend the pointless process that saw staff identify just 83 inadmissible claims identified out of 16,000 cases? For goodness sake, instead of them wasting their time on that, get them looking at asylum claims in the backlog. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, uh, the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is wrong to say or to suggest that the UK Government pressurises any individual to falsely identify as a child. It is the people smugglers that do that, and we are doing everything we can to clamp down on it. I have been to the Western Jet Foil at Dover to meet the members of our Border Force staff who try to make those assessments. At times, up to 20 per cent of the adult males who arrive at Western Jetfoil claim to be under 18, when quite clearly the number is very substantially less than that. We have already changed the law, uh, which I think the uh, SNP voted against, to change the way in which those tests are administered, and if we need to make further legal changes, we will do so. He's right to say that it is wrong that so many children, unaccompanied children in particular, are in hotel accommodation, and I want to change that. The way to do that is to encourage more local authorities throughout the United Kingdom to accept those individuals and to help them into private or state foster parenting arrangements. We've made in place a significant financial package to ensure that that can happen of around 52 
£6,000 a year per foster carer per child, plus a £6,000 upfront payment to the local authority to help uh, accommodate it. So there is the financing available, and I want to ensure more local authorities step up. And if he can encourage those run by his SNP colleagues in Scotland to do so, I'd be very happy to support him. James Dunn. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yeah. The question for my right hon. Friend is not how many hotels we can book, it is stopping the increase in migrants coming across yeah. the Channel this year. Yeah. We have seen over 10,000 adult males from Albania, Shocking. aged 18 to 40, Holy. between 1 Shocking. and 2 per cent of the population coming to the United Kingdom. We will not have enough hotels in the United Kingdom if it continues at this rate. Can I therefore ask my right honourable friend to take what his view is on the agreement that was entered into on the November the 18th, 2002, between the German government and Albanian government, which allowed Germany to deport Albanians who did not arrive in the country with a valid residence permit, yeah, taking yeah. quick yeah, action yeah, yeah. to take people out of the country Simple. who shouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, my honourable friend raised an extremely important point that we want our asylum system to be available to those who truly need it, those who are fleeing persecution, war, human rights abuses around the world. We should not be a harbour for those who are essentially economic migrants coming from safe countries like Albania. We need to change that. We have negotiated now a return agreement with Albania, and a 1,000 Albanians already have been returned home under that. I want to see, and I know my right hon. the Home Secretary shares my view, a fast track now whereby Albanians who do not meet our asylum criteria have their cases processed quickly and are swiftly returned home. It cannot be right that we are seeing thousands of Albanians making this crossing and essentially taking advantage of the welcome and hospitality afforded to them here in the UK. Chair the Select Committee, Dame Diana Jones. Mr Speaker, uh, can I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for securing this urgent question today. And tomorrow the Home Affairs Select Committee will be visiting Manston, our second visit, as we visited first in June. And alongside looking at the overcrowding, the safety issues and the lack of basic facilities, there is this concern about the legality of the Home Secretary's actions in authorising individuals to, to be detained at Manston for over 24 hours. And weekend media reports suggested that the Home Secretary was repeatedly provided with advice that detaining individuals at Manston for over 24 hours was illegal. And the Sunday Times reports on the 4th of October, the Home Secretary received papers stating that the Home Office had no power to detain people solely for welfare reasons or for arranging onward accommodation. So could the Minister just explain to the House the legal basis for detaining individuals for longer than 24 hours at Manston? Well, I'm grateful to um, the Right Honourable Lady, the Chair of the Select Committee, for that question. The law is clear that we should not be detaining individuals at a site like Manson for longer than 24 hours, and that is exactly the position that we want to return to as fast as we can. There are competing legal duties upon us as ministers. Another legal duty that we need to pay heed to is our duty not to leave individuals destitute. And I think it would be wrong for the Home Office to allow individuals who have only recently arrived in the United Kingdom, and bearing in mind that the vast majority of those at, Ma at Manston have literally been saved at sea by Border Force, by the RNLI and the Royal Navy, and brought there in a condition of some destitution, it would not be right for us just to release those people onto the rural lanes of Kent without great care. And so it is for that reason that the Home Secretary has balanced her duties and has taken the steps that are required to procure more hotel accommodation as swiftly as we can, and she can see the work that we've done already. I would just say briefly in answer to the first part of her question, the conditions at Manston were poor because there were too many people there. But the conditions do provide a wide range of facilities. Individuals are clothed. They're fed three times a day. There's an excellent medical facility. I've seen these things with my own eyes, and I hope that she does as well. So we do need to keep a sense of proportion about the state of Manston. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Oh, and, um, when, I hear, when I hear words like sourcing housing and getting extra 
hotel spaces for illegal immigrants, it leaves a bitter taste in my throat. And I'll tell you what, I've got 5,000 people in Ashfield want to secure council housing and they cannot get one, and yet we're debating this nonsense once again. When are we going to stop blaming the French, the ECHR, the lefty lawyers? The blame lies in this place right now. When are we going to go back home and do the right thing and send them straight back the same day? Well, my honourable friend is right that in sourcing accommodation for migrants, we should be guided by both our common desire for decency, because those are our values, but also, also hard-headed common sense. And it is not right that migrants are put up in three or four-star hotels at exorbitant cost to the United Kingdom taxpayer, or that migrants who are coming here illegally are giving, given preference of any sort over British citizens. And that is the kind of approach that we're going to take going forwards. We are now going to work closely with our uh, allies in France to ensure that more crossings are stopped in northern France. And the Prime Minister will be speaking with President Macron this week uh, whilst they are in Egypt. And we hope to take forward that partnership productively and constructively in the months ahead. Stella Cruz. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The second half of this urgent question was explicitly about the safeguarding of minors in the hotels, accompanied minors. That matters because there are thousands of children, verified children, in these hotels. And last week we learned that two of them in Walthamstow, one a child under the age of 13, were sexually assaulted in the hotel. More cases have come to light since of sexual assault on children in these hotels. We are all clear those who committed these crimes must be held responsible. And we all have duties to these children, just as we have to any other child under state protection. Now, when I asked the Home Secretary about it, she made a cheap drive about hotels, the Minister didn't even mention these children at all Shame. in his response. Hasn't yet even given us a straight answer. So can I ask him, because I think all of us in this House would be concerned about sexual assault of children of any background, surely. Can he publish the details of all these cases, including how many incidents of violence or sexual assault against children in these hotels have occurred in the last year, what action has been taken, and crucially, what safeguarding the private companies running these companies have to undertake? Because if he won't publish that, it tells us what he thinks about these children and all of our responsibility to them. Well, it's a pity that the Honourable Lady takes that approach because I take my responsibilities to children, whether accompanied or otherwise, very seriously. We have put in place a wide range of uh, support mechanisms. I mentioned earlier the work that we're doing for unaccompanied children. The hotels there, most of which are in Kent, have extremely sophisticated support, which is in fact costing the taxpayer up to £500 a night for that accommodation, which gives the Honourable Lady a degree of the support that we're making available. The best thing that she could do would be to support her local authority and encourage others to take more unaccompanied children and families into good quality local authority accommodation or to find them foster care in the community. That is the task that we need because we need to disperse these individuals as fast as we can across the country. And she may shake her head, but I'm afraid that suggests she doesn't understand that the way to resolve this issue is to help the children out of hotels and into the community as fast as we can. Simon Fell. Mr Speaker, I'm looking forward to my second visit to Manston tomorrow with the Home Affairs Select Committee, and, and I'm glad that he's managed to uh, get the numbers down in Manston, that's really important, but it does strike me that all we're doing is moving a problem from Manston into our communities. Yeah. What we really need to do to solve this is get through the backlogs and allow our communities to rest and stop creating an environment where the far right can can take root in, in constituencies like mine and like many of my, my friends around this house. So with that in mind, what measures is my right honourable friend taking to, to surge Home Office processing capacity so we can actually deal with the problem at the heart of this issue? Well, it's essential that we accelerate decision-making now within the Home Office. 
we have piloted over the course of the summer an approach which would very substantially increase decision making. This has been done in our Leeds office and we intend now to roll it out across the country as quickly as we can. And this would take us from an average of around one and a half decisions per caseworker per week to as many as four caseworkers per week. We also want, in slightly longer time, to review all of the red tape and bureaucracy that surrounds the process so we can ensure that our system is more streamlined and indeed to look at why, in the UK, we have a much higher approval rate for asylum than in many comparable countries like France and Germany, because that at the heart of the issue is why so many people choose to come here to shop around for asylum in the UK and to choose the UK when they're in fact economic migrants. Diane Abbott. Yeah. The House <coughs> welcomes the fact that the numbers at Manston have gone down, but the Minister will be aware that the concerns, notably of the Independent Chief Inspector of Bulls and Immigration, David Neal, wasn't just the numbers, it was conditions. Exactly. And when he came to give evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee, he told us that he thought there was a risk of fire, disorder and infection. Is the Minister confident that these risks no longer exist? And on the question of unaccompanied children, how many unaccompanied children are there in Manston? What effort is it being made to safeguard them? For instance, are they having to sleep next to males that they don't know? And when it comes to unaccompanied children in hotels, could he tell the House specifically how they are being safeguarded? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there should be no unaccompanied children at Manston. Unaccompanied children are taken directly either from the Western Jet Foil or in some cases when they immediately arrive at Manston to specialist hotels where they are looked after with a range of support provided for them. As I said in answer to a previous question, that in itself is not a desirable outcome. We want to ensure that those young people are quickly taken to better accommodation, particularly foster carers. That does rely on us being able to find more, and there is a national shortage of foster carers. That's why we put in place uh, a financial package to try to uh, stimulate the market and encourage more people and councils to step up and provide that service. Uh, she makes an important point around conditions at the site. Conditions were poor when I last visited, uh, but the primary reason for that was the sheer number of individuals who were there. The staff that I met were providing a very good quality of care in difficult circumstances. The food was acceptable, the health and medical facility was good, and the clothing and other support that was provided was something which I thought was acceptable and is certainly far in excess of that which would be provided in other European countries. Uh, the individuals who arrive at Manson, you have to remember, have literally been hooked out of the sea. We've saved their lives just hours previously, and many of them have come from significantly worse accommodation, like the camp, for example, at Dunkirk. I'm not saying the UK should compare itself to that. We want to be better. Uh, but I think you'll find that the camp, uh, that the facility at Manston is now in a significantly better state. But I'd be interested in hearing my right and more friend's reflections when she returns. Thank you, through. As my rightable friend is aware, his department is housing 400 asylum seekers in two hotels in my constituency, sited 50 metres apart on a busy motorway junction. With no basic amenities nearby or extra resources for local services such as healthcare and policing, their location is, is wholly unsuitable and I fear could lead to significant safeguarding issues. Ahead of our meeting tomorrow, which I thank him for, uh, will he put together a timetable for their closure and in the meantime ensure that Erewash gets extra support to manage the situation on the ground? Mr. Well, my honourable friend was uh, swift to raise this matter with me as soon as it was brought to her attention and she has uh, raised the issues that she said on the floor of the House today with me and with my officials and I look forward to meeting her tomorrow to take that forwards. As I said in answer to an earlier question, the hotels are not a sustainable answer. We want to ensure that we exit the hotels as quickly as possible. And to do that, we'll need to disperse individuals 
to other forms of accommodation, we may need to take some larger sites to provide decent but basic accommodation. And of course, we'll need to get through the backlog so that we can get more people out of the system either by returning them uh, to their home country or granting them asylum so they can begin to make a contribution to the UK. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And while we, we welcome um, the Minister's assurances that decisions will be making more quickly, particularly since there's 89,000 people in the system who have been waiting more than six months for um, a decision, can he assure us that these won't just be box-ticking exercises and that speed will not be the determining factor, but efficiency, and that people will get a fair decision because we all want to see an end to this problem, and everything the government has done so far has just made it worse? Uh, well, she has my assurance that the standards of decision-making will be upheld, but we do believe we can do it in a far more productive manner than has been done in the past. And if we can make more decisions every week than we do today, then we'll get through the backlog as quickly as we can. John Rebel. Will the government legislate urgently to deal with the obvious loopholes in the law which are exploited by people smugglers and economic migrants? And I share concerns of my colleagues about the use of hotels in my area. My right hon. Friend, the Home Secretary, and I are reviewing whether further changes to the law are required. One area that we are particularly interested in is the modern slavery framework. That is uh, an important and well-meant uh, piece of legislation, but it is unfortunately being abused by a very large number of migrants today. And if we need to make changes to it so that we can ensure that it isn't exploited, we will do so. Lawrence Session Lobby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, like many other members have mentioned, I also have hotels in my constituency in conditions where a number of families are living in really bad conditions. The, home, the minister outlined that he wants to look at moving people away from those hotels. One of the key problems is the fact that asylum claims aren't being processed enough. Can I ask the minister if there's been any additional recruitment within the Home Office to actually look at the backlog of cases? Uh, yes, there has. We've now recruited uh, a thousand caseworkers, and we have a plan to recruit a further 500. Uh, those individuals will be trained by the very best decision makers, such as those who have been through the pilot that I mentioned earlier in Leeds. Together, this new workforce hopefully will be able to power through the backlog and ensure that decisions are made swiftly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can my right hon. Friend assure me that steps are being taken to rapidly address the speed at which asylum claims are being processed before we run out of hotels, and that economies of remote coastal towns like Ilfracombe and Newquay rely on their tourists? Can my right hon. Friend assure me that these hotels will be welcoming visitors for next spring's vital tourism season? Well, I certainly hope that, hope that that is the case. As I said earlier, my first priority was to ensure that Manston was operating in a legally compliant and decent manner. The second priority is to ensure that where we are using hotels, we're doing so judiciously and that officials or our contractors are applying the criteria that I and other ministers have set down, one of which is to ensure that we avoid tourist hotspots uh, like that which my honourable friend represents. And then, thirdly, it is essential that we exit the hotels altogether and move forward with a more sustainable strategy, which ensures that we deliver best value money for the taxpayer and we also have a fair and robust asylum system. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister confirm that to seek asylum is a perfectly legal thing within international law and therefore yeah, yeah. within UK law, yeah, yeah. and the loose use of the words illegal asylum seekers is actually dangerous yeah. for those individuals concerned? And I'd ask him, has he also been, been, has it been drawn to his attention, the Council of Europe report on pushbacks across Europe of people trying to seek a place of safety in a number of countries, including this one, where they've been pushed back and left in places of enormous danger? Will he confirm that Britain will not be involved in sea-bound pushbacks towards France, leaving people in enormous danger, and instead will recognise the humanitarian needs of, frankly, deeply desperate people who we should be holding out the hand of friendship to, not condemnation. Uh, well, the UK is not involved in pushbacks at sea. We uphold our international obligations in that respect. Uh, it is a, a right for an individual to claim asylum, 
and we want a system whereby those who are fleeing genuine persecution or war or human rights abuses can find refuge in the United Kingdom. The issue that we're grappling with today is the sheer quantity of individuals who are choosing to come here, leaving other safe countries like France, and that places an intolerable strain on our system and means that those individuals who we do want to offer support for find themselves in difficult circumstances. A fair and robust system would not encourage people to come across the Channel illegally in small boats. It would be predominantly based on resettlement schemes like the ones that we've engineered in recent years from Syria, from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, and that's the system that I want to build in the years ahead. Charter. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, on Thursday I was notified by the Home Office that the Fir Grove Hotel in Grappen Hall would become an asylum centre the following day. There was no discussion with the Borough Council, no notification to local residents. It's in the middle of a residential area, less than 200 yards from a primary school. I'm sure my right honourable friend would agree with me. It's simply not acceptable for the Home Office to steamroll ahead on a decision like this without the necessary consultation with local residents. And I'd be grateful if my right honourable friend would meet with me to discuss this, uh, this, this situation and look at how we can review and reverse this decision. Well, I'd be very happy to meet with uh, my honourable friend so we can discuss this and he can represent the views of his constituents. Uh, I can also uh, inform the House that I have agreed with my officials at the Home Office that, as a matter of course, all members of Parliament should be informed of new facilities being opened in their constituents ahead of time, that all local authorities should be informed and a proper uh, engagement undertaken with them so that we can better understand the specific issues and provide the support that might be needed. Uh, it, it isn't right that MPs and councils find out on social media uh, or third hand, and I intend to bring that to an end. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Some are heralding the horrors at Manston as the death of compassionate conservatism. For the rest of us, we knew it never existed, or at least not for a very long time. Since the last Prime Minister took office just weeks ago, we have seen the Home Secretary describe people fleeing war as invading our country. Lethal levels of overcrowding at the Manston camp, traumatised people dumped at Victoria Station with nowhere to sleep, and child refugees sexually assaulted. Is this the compassion the Prime Minister speaks of? And if not, how will these shameful examples be rectified? Well, the Honourable Lady should pay closer attention to what's actually happening. I actually have visited Manston. I actually have met the members of staff who are supporting these individuals at Western Jetfoil. I spent Saturday night at our Immigration Removal Centre in West London. And I can assure you, in every one of these situations, there are Border Force, there are Home Office, there are military personnel and others who are providing decent, compassionate care to those individuals who are coming to this country. But humanity and decency does not mean naivety. And that, I think, is where we take a different approach from the Honourable Lady. 30% of those people who have crossed the Channel this year alone have come from Albania. Albania is a demonstrably safe country. We have to draw the distinction, or else we simply won't be able to help those people who do deserve our care and support. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was concerned to learn uh, in, in media reports last week that not once but twice asylum seekers from Manson Centre were dropped off in Victoria Coach Station in my constituency. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that we must deal with asylum seekers responsibly, firmly and compassionately? And can he assure me that we will not see a repeat of what we saw last week? <laughs> Well, I thank the Honourable Lady, and she raised this with me immediately when it came to her attention, as I did with officials when I learnt of it. We have, in recent times, occasionally used a procedure whereby uh, asylum seekers are asked if they have a home of a friend or a relative where they could stay, and if that's the case, then they're bailed to that address. On balance, that is the right approach because it ensures that the taxpayer doesn't have to pay for them to stay in hotels. But of course, we've got to get that right. And in this case, it appears that a small number of individuals uh, were left at Victoria Station due to a miscommunication. They were later taken to hotels, I believe, in Norfolk and are being cared for appropriately. 
No, no, no. 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 Mr yeah. Speaker, my constituency hosts some of these hotels currently housing refugees and asylum seekers, and I've dealt with a number of cases specifically on the conditions. Now, the Minister earlier described these hotels as luxurious, and I have to ask if he's actually ever been to one and seen what I've seen, which is whole families living in cramped conditions, giving food so bad it makes them sick, and actually having to deal with infestations of bed bugs and other things which are also making them ill. Um, the, these, these are dire, they're not secure, they're not safe and they're certainly not suitable for vulnerable children. So will the minister admit that the Home Office has received a number of complaints about this and agree to reviewing and assessing the conditions in these hotels? Well, if the Honourable Lady has specific uh, allegations, then I'd suggest she brings those to me and I would very happily look into them. I have visited hotels and in general I've been reassured that they meet the right standard of decency. As I said earlier, it is not appropriate that we are putting up asylum seekers in luxurious hotels. And there have been numerous examples in the press and that have been brought to my attention since I took this role of accommodation, which is not appropriate. We have to respect the taxpayer and ensure that we're putting up asylum seekers in sensible accommodation. Decency is important and will be uh, a watchword for us, but deterrence has to be suffused through our approach as well, because we do not want to create a further pull factor for individuals to make this perilous crossing across the Channel, and we have to make the UK significantly less attractive to illegal immigration than our EU neighbours. Richard Drax. Yeah. Much has been made of the safeguarding of illegal migrants, which I think everyone in this House would agree with. What we're not talking about, I don't think, is the safeguarding of our, of our citizens. Thousands of people coming here, we do not know their background. Yeah, yeah. I write on my friend as being forced to put them into hotels because there's nowhere else for them to go. What guarantee can he give all our citizens who live near these hotels that they will be safe, particularly when we hear what's going on in these hotels yeah. themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, well, my honourable friend makes an important point, and uh, for that reason, I went with my honourable friend, the member for Dover, to meet her constituents on Friday morning, who have been at the sharp end of illegal migration. Because it's important that we don't just think of the migrants, but we think of our own citizens, who are also facing pressures from this situation. I, I can reassure him that, on arrival. Uh, we do screen individuals coming into the UK. Counter-terrorism police are present at all our facilities in Dover and in Manston and take action the, against those who uh, they might have suspicions regarding. But it is also important that when we choose hotels or accommodation, we do so judiciously so we don't place them in situations that might have safeguarding or other risks. And again, it is another reason why we need to move away from the hotel model altogether. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my recent parliamentary, written parliamentary question revealed that 220 children have gone missing from Home Office procured accommodation. We hear reports from across the country of a difficulty in securing school places for children in Home Office accommodation. And now we hear reports of the most grave matter of sexual assaults against children living in Home Office accommodation, at least one of which I believe to be in Home Office accommodation in my constituency, about which I previously raised safeguarding concerns and received a response from the Home Office that can only be described as dismissive and disinterested. When will the Minister accept that the Home Office is failing in the duty of the British state to vulnerable children on these shores, and when will he take steps to address this terrible situation? Yeah. Well, if the Honourable Lady has uh, specific and it sounds serious allegations, I'd be very happy to look into those for her. As I said in answer to her, uh, her Honourable Friend's question earlier, the key thing is for each and every one of us who care about this issue to go back to our local authorities and to encourage them to take more children into their care. Otherwise, otherwise they will remain in hotels for far too long. Uh, my my honourable friend will know 
of my deep unease about the use of a hotel in Ashford, which has been opened recently as part of the dispersal from Manston. So I'm pleased to hear him say he wants to exit from the hotel use altogether. I think that would be a welcome step forward. Um, in the transition period before he can achieve that, uh, can he ensure that the Home Office takes more account in the future than it has in the past? of the relative level of pressure on public services such as health and education in different parts of the country of coping uh, with extra demand from asylum seekers. Uh, in particular, obviously, the, the pressure has been greatest in Kent than in other parts of the country, and I hope he can recognise this and the Home Office system can recognise this so we get a proper, fair dispersal around the country. Yeah. Well, my, my right hon friend makes a number of important points. Uh, part of our plan to exit the hotels is to ensure a fair dispersal around the country, and that means every local authority in all parts of the United Kingdom stepping up and playing its part. If we do that, then no area should be disproportionately affected. My right honourable friend represents an area that has borne the greatest burden, and it's absolutely right that we work together to find ways to alleviate the pressure on Kent wherever we can. And he and I are meeting, I believe, with Kent local authority leaders later in the week to hear their concerns. And if there are ways in which we can support them, I will certainly do everything I can to achieve that. I'm a little bit. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister explain what discussions have been held with the Children's Commissioner regarding this government's staggering levels of child neglect? And can he say why the Commissioner hasn't been encouraged to use her statutory powers to visit Manston and the hotels concerned to speak directly with the children there? Well, it's up to the Children's Commissioner to determine her own schedule. As far as I'm aware, she hasn't requested to visit Manston. I have no objection to her doing so, but that's entirely a matter for her. I would object to the suggestion that the UK government is being inhumane towards children. These are children who are coming across the Channel against our best wishes. They're coming either with their families, who are choosing to put them through this uniquely perilous journey, or in some cases, unaccompanied. We are doing absolutely everything we can to support them when they arrive here. But of course it's a difficult challenge. How would it be easy for the government to help hundreds of unaccompanied children when they arrive at sea and then require foster care and support? It's always going to be a difficult challenge, and we see that in our own constituencies when we hear of the shortage of foster care or concerns about local authority accommodation for young people. That is a national issue which is exacerbated by the sheer quantity of young people who are coming across in this way. Paul Maynard. Mr Speaker, uh, the Home Office is accommodating 400 asylum seekers in the Metropole Hotel in the centre of Blackpool in my constituency. It lies in Claremont, the fourth most deprived ward in the country, an area with a host of social problems and a difficult history of child sexual exploitation. These problems were pointed out when the hotel was first commissioned by the Home Office, by me and by the Council. Those issues have not changed. Dispersal from the hotel has been slow. I welcome the fact that he's going to exit the hotels, but can he make sure that the Metropole is the first hotel that he exits? Well, I'm grateful to uh, my honourable friend uh, for that question, and having worked with him in the past on a range of issues, I know how deeply and thoughtfully he addresses the issues in Blackpool. I appreciate that Blackpool is one of those areas that has borne a disproportionate burden from this issue for a long time. And so if there is a way in which we can ensure that individuals dispersed from Blackpool uh, more swiftly than other parts of the country, then I'd be happy to look into that. As I said earlier, my objective is that we exit the hotels and into more sustainable accommodation. That does require, in part, other local authorities to step up and play a greater role in accommodating, rather than relying time and again on our largest cities on Kent and on a small number of other local authorities, such as Blackpool. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The unsafe conditions and overcrowding at Manston has been totally unacceptable, mm -hmm. but the serious allegations of assault of our children is beyond unacceptable. But also we learnt last week that there were people that were seeking asylum were dropped off in, in Victoria, London. 
Now, we know that the Home Secretary is out of her depth and she is failing on this. But can the Minister say how many children were actually left unaccompanied last week? And more importantly, given the scale of this crisis, isn't it not now time that we have an independent investigation that can look into this serious issue and robustly report back on the ongoing challenges that are facing this Home Office? <laughs> Well, as far as I'm aware, the small group of individuals who uh, were left at Victoria Station were all adults. Uh, there were no children there, but I happily stand corrected and will uh, write to the Honourable Lady if I'm mistaken. There are unaccompanied children coming to the country, and we are doing everything we can to support them. But again, I, I would take issue that the accommodation, the medical care, the support that we're providing to these individuals is decent. It is humane, and it far surpasses that provided by comparable European countries. And we do have to ensure that deterrence is suffused through our system, or else we're only going to encourage more people to make that perilous journey across the UK and continue to make the UK a magnet for illegal immigration. And that's not something that we on this side of the House would want to see. Sir Edward Lee. There were recent reports that illegal migrants have been put up in a luxury rural hotel, a former stately home near Grantham, which normally charges £400 a night. Surely the easier you make this whole process and the quicker, the more people will come, especially as it's a complete pushover with a large number of young Albanian men claiming modern slavery, which is ridiculous. Isn't the solution, and will the Minister confirm this, to repeal the Human Rights Act get out of the European Refugee Convention, repeal the Modern Slavery Act so people can be detained when they arrive for being involved in an illegal activity and then deported? Uh, well, I too was disturbed to see uh, images of the Stoke Rochford Hotel, uh, which is a luxurious setting, and that's not the kind of hotel we want to see individuals being uh, accommodated in. We want to see decent, uh, but commonsensical treatment that doesn't create a further pull factor to the UK. My right hand friend, the Home Secretary, and I are going to review whether further changes are required. And we start from the basic principle that treaties that the UK Government has entered into must work in the best interests of the British people. Stephen Flint. Contrary to some of the dangerous, disgusting dog whistle right-wing rhetoric emanating from some members of the Conservative Party. Asylum seekers are people, and we should judge ourselves on how we treat our fellow man. So, in that regard, the Minister will be aware that there are very many people in hotels in Aberdeen who have been in those situations for well in excess of a year waiting for their asylum applications to be processed. When can we expect that particular issue to be resolved? Well, as I said in answer to an earlier question, we are working hard now to accelerate decision making so that individuals can either be granted asylum or be removed from the country. Uh, I would say, however, that there is a marked trend in the data, which is that some Scottish local authorities are taking a disproportionately low number of uh, asylum seekers in every respect. And so the first useful thing that the Honourable Gentleman could do would be go back to the local authorities that are controlled by the SNP in Scotland and ask them to step up. Kate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The town of Stocksbridge in my constituency is awaiting final confirmation of £24 million of government funding for our town deal. This £24 million will be a transformational sum for Stocksbridge, but it equates to just four days of taxpayer expenditure on hotel accommodation for people who have arrived illegally in the UK. Does my right hon. Friend agree with me that, as well as being a complex security and humanitarian issue for both the public and for genuine asylum seekers, the small boats crisis also represents a serious financial issue in these difficult economic times. Yeah, yeah. And can he expand on his previous answer about how the government will move away from the hotel, the expensive hotel model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my honourable friend and I have spent many happy hours in Stocksbridge, and I want to see the government investing even more in her community. And she's right to say that it is 
an unconscionable waste of taxpayers' money to be spending over £2 billion a year on hotel accommodation. That money could be put to better use, whether helping her constituents or fulfilling our broader mission as a country to support those who truly need it in distress at home or abroad. The approach that the Home Secretary and I are going to take is to speed up decision-making so that we can get people out of hotels because they've been, uh, their application has been decided to disperse people more fairly and evenly across the country, to see whether there are better value sites available to us, uh, and of course, to do everything we can to dissuade people from making the journey in the first place. Kevin Brennan. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Um, regarding his response earlier to the chair of the Select Committee, I wasn't quite clear uh, what he meant in his answer. Is it his position that the government acted legally in detaining migrants at Manston for more than 24 hours. The government's objective is to ensure that nobody stays at Manston for more than 24 hours, but we do have to balance up competing legal duties. We also have to be cognizant of the fact that not everything is within our control when we deal with this situation. It was clearly not within the control of the Home Office that thousands of individuals chose to get into small boats across the Channel in a very short series of days, and it certainly was not within our control that an individual chose to attack the Western jet foil on Saturday, ensuring that seven or 800 people were brought swiftly to the Manston site as a result of that. These are the difficult choices that we have to balance. There are no simple choices or solutions in the Home Office, but we have to act in the public interest. Dr Julian Lewis. Mr Deputy Speaker, our former Labour colleague Chris Mullin is one of the most thoughtful left-wingers I know. And would the Minister take a moment or two to have a look at the article that he has in the press today and commend it to people on both sides of the House given that even he feels it necessary to conclude that uncontrolled migration risks bringing down our fragile social systems and is driving politics across Europe into the hands of the extreme right. Yeah. Surely we have to recognise when the asylum system is being abused. If he can recognise it, so should people on both sides of yeah, this house. Yeah. Uh, well, I read uh, the former member's article in the Daily Telegraph, and I think he made a number of very important points. Uh, above all, he made the point that public concern about the level of migration into this country, and in particular illegal immigration, is very high, has continued to be high in recent years, and if we are to be Democrats, we have to listen to that and take action accordingly. We on this side of the House believe in secure borders, we believe in, crawl, in controlled migration, and we're concerned at the straying of community tensions and the fabric of communities if we don't take action accordingly. And the wise words from Chris Mullen are ones that certainly myself and the Home Secretary will heed. John McDonnell. Um, I wish to raise the situation in Harmsworth Detention Centre in my constituency mm. after the events at the weekend. And I'm grateful for the Minister for the call we had over the weekend. Um, my understanding from what he told me yesterday was that Harmsworth has now been decanted. Um, my fear is this, that it will, once the renovations have taken place, it will soon be filled again. It will soon be filled again because in this country we detain too many people who have created, who've engaged in no criminal activity. We, we, we detain too many and we detain them too long and I believe unjustly and in cases often brutally. Could I suggest to him one way of tackling this is of course sorting out the processing situation but it is also ensuring that we have an enforceable limit on how long people are actually <coughs> trapped in the process of assessment, but also specifically an enforceable limit on how long people can be detained in our detention centres. Well, I thank uh, the right hon. gentleman for those suggestions, and I'll, uh, I'll bear that in mind. We, I do respectfully disagree that those individuals who are destined to be removed from the UK, particularly foreign national offenders, should be in institutions like uh, the uh, Immigration Removal Centre in his constituency. I appreciate that not all of them are. Um, can I take the opportunity of his question to thank uh, his constituents and the uh, Immigration Enforcement Officers 
the prison officers and all those who responded heroically over the weekend to that disturbance. I'm pleased to say that it has now been brought under control, that all of the inmates at the site have been decanted to other IRCs and that the contractor will be making uh, the, the necessary improvements to the site as quickly as possible so that it can get back up and running, but also we can ensure that it doesn't happen again. Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My constituents are becoming sick and tired of this ridiculous narrative of economic migrants yeah, somehow yeah. being mistreated at Manston. The facts of the matter are that after a short time at the processing centre, <laughs> these economic migrants will receive free food and free accommodation in hotels, something my constituents who are paying for all of this yeah. could only dream of. How do you think my constituents who can't get a NHS dentist or a GP appointment or a council house feel about the fact that we're spending £2 billion a year on hotel bills because we can't be bothered to solve this issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's important that we do recognise what the United Kingdom is actually doing here. The vast majority of those who arrive at Manston have literally had their lives saved by the UK. The RNLI, Border Force, the Royal Navy has ensured that as many as 95% of those individuals are saved at sea, are brought to land, are given clothes, are given food, are given medical support, and are then processed at Manston until they can be accommodated elsewhere. So we should be clear about how we are meeting our obligations as a country, and in fact going far beyond that. Uh, of our neighbours. He's right, though, that, that uh, those standards of decency and humanity must be matched by hard-headed common sense, and we should not be accommodating individuals for long periods of time in expensive hotels. My method. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In an exchange last week relating to the situation at Manston, the Home Secretary told this House, I have never ignored legal advice. Has the Minister been briefed or seen any information in his department or been told by any colleagues any information that would show that that is not a correct statement to this House? Uh, I've no reason to believe that the Home Secretary has misled the House. The Home Secretary was advised that we needed to procure more hotels, and we have procured more hotels. Uh, dozens of further hotels so that thousands of migrants were able to leave Manston over the course of this week alone, and that's exactly the right approach. Richardson. Uh, Mr Deputy yeah. Speaker, important to my Guildford constituents and important to me, uh, does my right honourable friend agree that by controlling illegal immigration we can make sure that we've got the capacity and the facilities to offer safe and legal routes for vulnerable people across the world, as we have done for people in Ukraine, Hong Kong, Syria and Afghanistan? Yeah. Uh, well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The work that has been done uh, by this government and supported by local authorities and tens of thousands of our fellow citizens over the course of the last year to help people from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, from Hong Kong and elsewhere to find safety and in some cases a new life in the UK is something we should all be proud of. Our system should be based on safe resettlement schemes rather than individuals crossing the channel illegally in small boats. Jim Shannon. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister first of all for his answers to the questions, which are very difficult and complex. Uh, I, I know that tensions are rising as the temperatures are dropping in the United Kingdom and government are intending to pay out large amounts of money for heating. But I am concerned, Minister, that ill feeling towards migrants is growing as people mistake the illegal immigration from the legal asylum seeking. So, will the Minister outline how his department intends to ensure that those who have no right to be in this country are treated with respect and care, but will not be allowed to overstay beyond that which is fair, equitable and enshrined in law. Well, the honourable gentleman is absolutely right. The UK wants to be a big-hearted country that welcomes those in need to our shores, but we must ensure that those who come here illegally uh, for economic migration or other purposes are removed as swiftly as possible because it brings the whole system into disrepute and it makes it impossible for us to treat people who deserve our care in the way that we would want them to see. And at the moment, the system is frankly overwhelmed by the sheer number of individuals coming here, a very large proportion of which should not come here because they are economic migrants. Walker. 
Uh, one of the locations hosting migrants in my constituency is the Founds Hotel. And notwithstanding the fact that I raised concerns about the suitability of that location, I was particularly concerned to hear from my council about a number of children being taken into care uh, from that location. Now, my right hon. friend mentioned um, an incentive package uh, for councils. What I was told is that this was putting an additional burden on an already overburdened children's care system. Can he make sure he discusses with his officials to make sure that even when the children weren't supposed to be in a particular location, uh, that support will flow through to councils? Uh, because the, the impression I've been left with by, by Worcestershire is that they're trying to do the right thing, uh, but they weren't, either weren't aware of or weren't receiving that support. Uh, well, I will certainly ensure that local authorities are better communicated with about uh, the uh, location of children to their area and the support that the government is making available. And I'm holding later this week a uh, teleconference with all local authority chief executives and leaders to listen to their views and advise them of our steps. And on the back of that, if there are changes we need to make to our processes, I'll certainly try my best to do so. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Inhumane centres and overcrowded, let alone unsafe, hotels, there's no place to, to place these very vulnerable families. In the light that we know of the success of the Homes for Ukraine scheme, why won't the Home Office Minister set, apart, set out to, to have a Homes for Refugee and Asylum Seekers scheme so people can be settled in communities, supported and be kept safe? Well, there is already a community sponsorship scheme uh, available for community groups who want to bring uh, refugees to the United Kingdom and to care for them appropriately. I would like to see more community groups take part in that and if there are ways in which we can simplify it and ensure its success, I'll be happy to do so. She mentions the Homes for Ukraine scheme, which I personally feel very passionately about. That is now facing some challenges because a number of individuals are coming up to the end of their six-month process and we need to encourage more families to come forward and take in those. And I'm working with my right hon. friend, the Community Secretary, to establish a rematching service so we can ensure that those families are properly looked after. Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I appreciate the challenge that my right hon. friend and the department are facing, but we can solve the problem of accommodation by stopping illegal entry into this country yeah, in the yeah, first yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, will he please, please, on behalf of my very frustrated constituents, leave no stone unturned in finding a solution to this problem and stopping illegal entry? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we have been debating today the symptoms of the problem rather than the cause, which is the sheer quantity of individuals crossing the channel illegally. We're going to tackle that on multiple fronts whether that be through the NCA, our security and policing resources, ensuring that we bear down on the criminal gangs and gather the best possible intelligence on the continent, diplomatically uh, with France, with Albania and other partner countries, or in ensuring that how we do treat people in this country where, while decent and appropriate, does not produce a further draw to the UK and ensuring that deterrence is suffused through our approach is extremely important. Patrick Grady. I think it's worth reiterating once again that seeking asylum is not illegal. Yep. But if the government really wants to uh, save a little bit of money, why doesn't it extend the right to work to people who are seeking asylum? Because if they did that, they would become more self-efficient. They could find and pay for their own accommodation. They could ease the massive labour shortages facing this country, and they could pay some tax into the Exchequer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've listened carefully to the arguments on both sides of that issue, and I appreciate that uh, colleagues will uh, respectfully disagree with me, but I think it's extremely important that we don't create further pull factors to the UK. The UK is already arguably a more attractive destination for illegal migration than our European neighbours. There's a wide range of reasons for that, uh, but I don't want to see us create any further pull factors that will only make the situation worse. McLean. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My Redditch constituents are generous and compassionate and have opened their hearts and their homes to refugees from 
around the world, but they find it deeply illogical and infuriating and completely unfair to see these boatloads, uh, small boats arriving on our southern shores. Surely every sovereign nation has the right to control its borders. And what we're seeing, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that it is, imp it is possible for an Albanian male under our modern slavery legislation to become a confirmed victim of modern slavery. This is not what this world-leading and compassionate legislative framework was set up to achieve. It has rescued many vulnerable people from awful situations. So when will he bring forward a review of this legislation to make sure it's fit for purpose and can do what it's intended to do and not be a fast-track route for Albanian males? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend has spoken on this a number of occasions and uh, draws on her own experience at the Home Office uh, and elsewhere. She's right that the modern slavery laws, whilst important and well meant, are now being abused, uh, particularly by uh, males who are here for economic migration purposes. We've seen many cases where uh, young males from countries like Albania, as she says, have their asylum claims processed, they're rejected quite rightly, and then immediately they make a claim under modern slavery laws. That is wrong, and we intend to review that, as she says, and to make any changes that we need to. And is slaughter. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, from what the Minister said to my honourable friend, the Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, and the Home Secretary told the House last week, they balanced breaking the law by leaving asylum seekers in Manston for weeks against breaking the law by abandoning them on the streets without means. And then, Victoria Station aside, they decided to commit the first piece of law breaking. Will the Minister publish the advice that's led him to that unusual legal opinion? Well, it's not the convention for us to publish legal advice, but I've been very clear uh, today and in, in, other, in other public appearances that it's absolutely essential that Manston, like other sites, operate within the law. And in this case, it means ensuring that individuals are treated decently and humanely there and stay for 24 hours unless there are exceptional reasons to the contrary. In this case, it was right that the Home Secretary balanced that amongst wider concerns to leave individuals destitute. It was also the case that this is a site which has seen very large numbers of migrants crossing the channel at short notice illegally, and that put huge pressure on our facilities there. We also had to deal with the aftermath of what is now being treated as a terrorist incident, which led to 700 individuals being evacuated to the site. I can assure the Honourable Gentleman that we have made huge progress over the course of the week. We are now at the right level of capacity and we are working to ensure that individuals don't stay there for any longer than 24 hours. Jack Burton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is extremely disappointing that we continue to see the Home Office pursuing uh, hotels in Socon Trent, and particularly given the concerns we've raised about the risks associated with doing so, and the fact that we already have over 800 refugees resettled in Socon Trent. So will my right and more friend look at measures to ensure that other parts of the country that have done little to nothing yet to actually help uh, provide accommodation are told to do so? Well, he, my honourable friend is absolutely right that the burden of uh, uh, migrants in hotel and other accommodation has uh, historically been borne by our cities, and Stoke has disproportionately borne a significant quantity. We have now tried to disperse individuals more broadly, and some of the issues that we've heard today are as a result of migrants being placed in hotels in locations where that would not previously have happened, and so it is a new issue for those local authorities uh, to cope with. We need to ensure that we provide the right support to those local authorities, and we have a dispersal strategy now to encourage um, individuals to be placed more fairly across the country, which should, hope should in time provide a fairer settlement for places like Stoke-on-Trent. If the dispersal strategy is to be successful, then local authorities must be engaged in the conversation before they are told what is happening in their own local authority. That way we can ensure that the correct support, services and funding are in place. Otherwise, does the Minister not just risk fueling the increasing intolerance and bigotry? Well, the Honourable Gentleman is, is right 
My first priority was to ensure that the Manston site was operating legally and appropriately, and that meant that the Home Office had to procure accommodation at pace. We are now moving into the next phase, and that will, ensure, that will involve ensuring that we have better communication and engagement with local authorities so that we can hear their concerns, we can provide them with the support that they might need, and we can choose locations together which meet sensible criteria in terms of safeguarding, community cohesion, and the availability of public services. It's also extremely important that we work closely with local authorities on issues like child protection and the dispersal, appropriately, of children of families across the country. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So we've heard about international law and how we can't break it. We've heard about the ECHR. But in 2005 and ever since, we chose to ignore the ECHR and an EU diktat requiring us to give people in prison the vote. In other words, we ignored international law because we respected our people's wishes. Why is it that Italy and other EU nations can do the same today, and we do not, when it comes to foreign criminal gangs and people smugglers arising from illegal immigration? Why, Minister, don't we protect our borders and our people? We will do everything in our power to protect our borders. I've already set out that we're going to do that on a number of fronts. We're going to do it through law enforcement, robustly tackling the criminal gangs on the continent. We're going to do it through better diplomatic relations with our nearest allies like France. And my right friend, the Prime Minister, is having one of those conversations this week with President Macron. We're going to work with countries like Albania, which are demonstrably safe and where economic migrants in particular should be returned swiftly. And if there are further legal changes that are required, we will consider making them, because treaties that the UK is a signatory of should work in the best interests of the British people. Brendan Clark Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Many will have tuned into their TVs yesterday to see people living in tents and eating food many would find vomit-inducing. But this is not in Australia, this is elsewhere in mainland Europe. And does my right honourable friend agree with me? It is therefore insulting to hear the opposition saying the accommodation and hospitality offered by this country is not good enough, when many of my constituents would be grateful to be afforded such luxury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we should treat individuals coming to the UK with decency. Those are our values. But he is absolutely right to say that the standard to which we look after those arriving on our shores in almost every case surpasses easily that of other countries and you only have to compare the standards of Manston which I've seen myself in the last week with those of the camp in Dunkirk to see the difference we should be proud of the way that we support individuals coming to the UK that's the British way but we should do so in a commonsensical way that also looks after the best interests and the value for money of the British taxpayer Tom Hunt Deputy Speaker I, don't, I remember it wasn't too long ago that the uh, opposition benches were bringing the motion opposing the use of Napier barracks for illegal immigrants I'd much rather have that than use of another hotel in the centre of Ipswich where 20 jobs have been lost by my constituents as a result ultimately though, will the Minister agree with me that the Rwanda policy is the right policy, and ultimately yeah, yeah, yeah. that will create one of the most powerful deterrent effects. Could the Minister give me some clarity about the timescale for when this is likely to be implemented, um, and the new Bill of Rights, how that could help bring it to fruition as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, as I've said in answer to many questions this afternoon, deterrence has to be suffused through our entire approach so that we don't make the UK a draw for illegal migration. The Rwanda policy is one element of that, and it would produce a significant deterrent effect. It's currently subject to legal action. Uh, we expect to hear more on that shortly. Uh, but as soon as we are able to proceed with it, he can be assured that we will do so. Mr Kruger. Uh, does my right hon. Friend agree with me that in order to stop the flow of people across the Channel, we need to do two things. We need proper legitimate routes for people to claim asylum before they arrive in the UK, and we should also prioritise those who come here with community sponsors who can help them, as uh, the lady from York Central suggested, as we've already done for 100,000 Ukrainians. And secondly, we need to ensure that if people break into this country, they are not able to live here and to work, but they will be detained and deported. And if we need to change 
our laws or indeed the terms of our membership of the ECHR, we should do that. Well, I pay tribute to my honourable friend for the good work he did at the uh, Department for Leveling Up in helping to establish the Homes for Ukraine scheme. And that scheme established the principles that he has set out, which I think we would, which I think would be a better way forward for our asylum system, that asylum to this country was predominantly through resettlement schemes like those we've seen in Syria, Afghanistan and Ukraine, where individuals came here through safe and legal routes, enabling the UK to prioritise those truly endangered. And those who come here illegally, for example in small boats, find it more difficult to find safe harbour here and are returned home to their home country. Simon Baines. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. During my brief tenure as the Minister for Tackling Illegal Migration in the summer, I visited Manston. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the staff working at Manston deserve our praise for the excellent care and attention they take in their work, particularly as it is often takes place in very challenging circumstances? Can I thank the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his important uh, short service commission this summer. We are very grateful for the work he did. Uh, he is right to say that the staff at Manston have behaved heroically. I was hugely impressed by the Border Force officers that I met, the contractors, the cooks, uh, the Armed Forces personnel. Uh, and my Home Office officials. They have moved heaven and earth over the course of the last week to ensure that that site is returned to a safe and uh, legal method of operation. And the way in which they treated people has always been with great care and courtesy, and we should all be proud of that. I'd like to thank the Minister for responding to the urgent question and answering questions for an hour and 20 minutes. So thank you very much. I'll just pause a second while people choreograph themselves in and out. We now move to move to programme number two motion to be moved formally. Move formally. The question is, is on the order of papers, may I please say aye? Aye. No, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Social Housing Regulation Bill Lords, second reading. Now. Minister, to move second reading. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. With um, your permission, I'd like to move the second reading of the Social Housing Regulation Bill, which was, of course, first introduced in the other place. Um, the Social Housing Regulation Bill is one of a number of steps that Government has taken in the aftermath of the dreadful tragedy that occurred at Grenfell in 2017. Uh, everyone in the House was uh, shocked by what happened on that night when 72 people lost their lives in one of the most horrific civilian tragedies that has ever occurred in these islands. Uh, the suffering of those who uh, were uh, the victims of that tragedy is almost impossible to relate, and the testimony and the forbearance and endurance of uh, the survivors, of the bereaved, of relatives and residents is something that is very much in all our minds as we consider how we can appropriately learn lessons from that tragedy, put right what went wrong, and ensure at last that those who suffered receive justice. Delighted. Thank you. I welcome the Secretary of State back to his position. Um, because I say this because I think he did make some progress on the Cladden issue when he was Secretary of State. Just on the point of Cladden and, and Grenfell, the Minister will be aware that the personal evacuation plans for disabled people is still not in place, even though the former, former Prime Minister confirmed that they will take up all the recommendations of Grenfell. Would the Secretary of State please look at that? Yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady, who, as well as doing fantastic work on uh, the Select Committee in trying to make sure that on building safety and on other issues that appropriate progress has, made, has been made, has also been a very effective 
uh, advocate for her constituents in this regard as well. Um, I just wanted to emphasise that uh, in the wake of the Grenfell tragedy, there is a, a significant body of work that this government has to undertake, and she's quite right to hold us to account for the speed with which we do it. There is work that needs to be done on building safety overall, and we've introduced legislation, the Fire Safety Act and the Building Safety Act, in order to uh, take forward some of the recommendations that were already uh, being generated by the inquiry, um, and indeed in some cases we did not have to wait for those recommendations to know that we needed to act. But she mentions a very important uh, factor, the uh, personal evacuation plans. And, and again, this is a difficult and sensitive question. A number of those affected by the Grenfell tragedy were individuals who were living with disabilities. Making sure that those individuals have uh, the correct regime in place in order to ensure that they are safe in the homes uh, that they live in and they deserve to be safe, and also if disaster were to strike, that they can be um, uh, in a position and the fire and rescue services can be in a position to make sure that they can be evacuated safely is critical. I have heard some of the concerns that were expressed by residents and others about the Home Office's response to recommendations on uh, PEEPSs, and therefore I think it is important for me to work with the new minister in the uh, Home Office dealing with this issue. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for Derbyshire Dales, in order to ensure that we can listen to what residents have said um, and, I hope, do better. Because listening to what residents have said is absolutely critical to our whole approach towards what happened in Grenfell and the broader concerns with the quality of social housing and the safety of those within social housing, which that tragedy underlined our need to act on. I am more than happy to give way to uh, my hon. Friend. I will give way to all other colleagues as well, but to my hon. Friend, the member for Walsall North, who did so much when he was a minister uh, to put these things right. Mr Speaker, it was an absolute privilege to work with the Secretary of State and be tasked with converting the social housing thank you converting the social housing white paper into the robust legislation we see before us today but having listened to the podcast on the Grenfell Tower inquiry does the secretary of state agree with me that one of the overriding ambitions of this legislation is to ensure that social housing tenants get treated at all times with respect and that we remove any stigma that is associated with this tenure Yes. And my honourable friend is absolutely, as ever, 100% spot on. Um, even before the, the Grenfell tragedy, it was clear that the way in which tenants were being treated in social housing in far too many cases, and particularly, it, it pains me to say, in Kensington, was simply not good enough. I, I'll just say a little bit about this and then, of course, give way. And uh, uh, we have. Uh, uh, vivid documentary evidence of the way in which the tenant management organisation that was responsible for the refurbishment of Grenfell simply did not listen to tenants. and It behaved in a, a high-handed fashion. Uh, it was the case that their safety was not given the importance that it deserved, and a number of residents, including Ed Defarne uh, uh, of Grenfell United, the survivor of that night, were very clear about the risks that were being run were not listened to, and one of the most powerful uh, lessons of the tragedy is that we must ensure that tenants in social housing uh, feel that their voice is heard. And exactly as my honourable friend says, any of the uh, high-handed and aloof behaviour exhibited by some towards people uh, who are uh, the most deserving of our protection should, and I hope it will. Very happy to give way to the honourable lady, then the honourable gentleman, then the honourable gentleman. Uh, can I thank the secretary? Saying, can I also welcome him back uh, to his position uh, as secretary of state? I just wanted to go back very briefly to the um, intervention from my honourable friend in relation to peeps for disabled people. And as he knows, the Home Office hasn't didn't accept that particular mm. recommendation. So, is it his view? that these peeps should be in place for disabled people that are living in high-rise blocks? Well, I think that we do need to look again at the position. I, and I have to be careful because the Home Office is a separate department and I'm not the Secretary of State there. Um, but I do know that the new Home Secretary and the new Minister responsible for fire safety do appreciate and understand the need to look closely at the, uh, uh, the voice and concerns of tenants that were expressed on the previous position. I have to say the previous position was taken in good faith but the concerns expressed are those that we need to pay attention to. Happy to give way. I am sure we all want um, social landlords, all landlords, to be held to account where they fall short. Would the Secretary accept there may be a, 
a problem with some financial penalties in that you end up punishing tenants twice, once having a bad landlord and then again by having funds withheld. For a specific example, if a, and this is my own constituency, a social landlord who is failing financially and is therefore penalised by not being able to bid to the building safety fund, with the consequence that either fire safety works don't get done or that other means, such as sale of property or not developing other properties, uh, building new properties comes about. Would, would he look at that specific instance and see whether we can not penalise tenants in that way? Yes, I'm, uh, the Honourable Gentleman makes a fair point, which is that there are lots of pressures on registered social landlords and housing associations. Um, and while this bill is there in order to ensure that uh, 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 all emulate the best, I do appreciate that with pressures to increase supply, pressures on building safety, and pressures also to deal with the poor quality stock that many have inherited, uh, that we do need to be sensitive, and I'm sure the regulator will be in the application of any fines if uh, the correct action is not being taken. Happy to give way. I thank you, Minister, for, for giving way, and, and, and I do welcome you back to your position again. I look forward to your, your significant contributions to this, uh, this issue. Uh, in, in relation to lessons learnt, and, and obviously it's good to have lessons learnt, but it's also good to share those. Uh, and obviously, we don't have the same uh, amount of, of uh, high-rise uh, apartment blocks in Northern Ireland as we have here in London or elsewhere across the United Kingdom. But we do have some. We have housing executive, we have housing association, and we have some private as well. Uh, ha has the minister, in, in, in his return, been able to share that information about better safety with all of the regions, in particular with those of Northern Ireland? Thank you. Yes, of course. I mean, this legislation. I'm very grateful to uh, the right honourable gentleman, the honourable gentleman, for, for raising it. This legislation, of course, applies to England and to housing associations and social landlords in England. But in my other role as uh, Minister for Intergovernmental Relations, I've been able to talk to uh, ministers and officials in the devolved administrations about some of these building safety questions, and we all have a shared interest in in getting them right. And of course, we respect the nature of. Uh, devolved competence here, but we also want to make sure that uh, some of the insights, particularly about how we deal with uh, uh, developers, can be uh, uh, operationalised UK-wide. Uh, yes, of course. I'm very grateful to him. Post what he rightly described as the absolute tragedy of Grenfell, if he were to be presented in this debate this evening with evidence of a housing association that continues to take a complacent attitude to the fire safety of its tenants. Would he regard that as a very serious matter indeed? I certainly would. My right honourable friend uh, is absolutely right that housing associations and other social landlords have to take safety incredibly seriously. This legislation is intended to ensure that they do. If it is the case that there are housing associations or other social landlords that are not taking safety, and in particular fire safety, seriously, I would be most grateful uh, if he and others were to share that information with me. I know that he has been a uniquely assiduous constituency MP, and I know also that his concern in particular uh, for uh, the vulnerable and the voiceless uh, is such that uh, he will raise his voice on their behalf and we will do everything we can to act. Um, I just wanted to uh, say before going on to the meat of the bill that, um, uh, as a number of uh, members have quite rightly pointed out, there are a range of issues that do need to be tackled in the wake of the Grenfell tragedy, as well as legislating on building safety. We also need to make sure that there is action, and in particular action from some of those who have a direct responsibility for fixing the problems that they helped to create. And I'm very grateful to um, the uh, uh, two Secretaries of State uh, who uh, both succeeded um, and indeed preceded uh, my position here, um, the member for Tunbridge Wells um, and the member, member for uh, uh, Middlesbrough South and Cleveland. Both of them in office uh, accelerated the efforts that we were undertaking in order to ensure that developers who were responsible for uh, buildings that were not safe uh, accept the responsibility for remediating those buildings. Uh, there have been some indications from some speaking apparently on behalf of developers that because of uh, economic headwinds that we are all facing globally, uh, they feel that perhaps the weight of obligation that has been placed on their shoulders should be lessened somewhat. It may have an impact on supply, it may have an impact on their bottom line. Let me make clear from this dispatch box that it cannot be the case that economic conditions which affect us all are being used by developers or anyone else to shuffle off their obligations. Similarly, there are freeholders 
who have direct responsibility to uh, the uh, leaseholders in the buildings that they ultimately own to remediate those buildings. That is their legal obligation. This House, this Parliament, has passed laws in order to ensure they fulfil that obligation. There are some freeholders, organisations of significant means, that are again trying to delay or dilute their responsibilities. This is simply not acceptable. And I hope across this House we will make it clear. Yes, these are tough economic times, but they are very tough economic times for the most vulnerable in our society. And there is no way that PLCs and other organisations with healthy balance sheets and surpluses and CEOs who are earning handsome remuneration can somehow use global economic conditions as an excuse for shuffling off their responsibility. It just won't do, and all of us across this House will work to ensure that that work of remediation is done and there will be no hiding place for those responsible. Um, now, I wanted to, uh, in bringing forward uh, this uh, legislation today, uh, thank, first of all, all colleagues in the House of Lords who contributed to improving the legislation while it was there. I'm sure when the legislation goes into committee, there may well be amendments from uh, backbench colleagues across the House that can contribute to improving the legislation. Um, and I know that my colleagues in the House of Lords were grateful to those uh, 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 noble colleagues who contributed to the enhancement of the bill. Um, and in particular, I want to thank Lord Greenhalgh, who as Building Safety and Fire Safety Minister introduced the legislation and who served with such distinction in the Department. I also want to thank, as well as um, my uh, honourable friend, the member for Walsall North, for all the work that he did not just on this legislation, but on legislation in the private rented sector and in homelessness, to thank uh, 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 Robert Jack, sorry, uh, the member for Newark, uh, when he was Secretary of State, for the work that he did um, on the white paper that preceded this legislation. Um, and I also, in particular, uh, want to thank uh, my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead. It was her actions in the immediate aftermath of the Grenfell tragedy that set in train a programme of reform and the moral leadership that was shown by my right honourable friend in making sure that those in social housing got the full attention of government, which ensures that this legislation is before us today. I also want to thank um, two campaigners who, in the course of the last year, have shone a light on some of the worst conditions in social housing and have reminded us all how important it is to ensure that our regulator has teeth. Uh, Quaja Twenenboer, uh, a young man who I think all of us in this House have seen campaigning um, with, uh, uh, with eloquence and passion. Uh, he himself, having grown up in social housing, has acted as a, uh, a voice for those who may have been overlooked and underserved in the past. And of course, Daniel Hewitt of uh, ITV News, who's worked with Quadro and others in order to make sure that uh, uh, those registered social landlords who have not been performing their duties adequately are held up to proper scrutiny. It's important, of course, in this debate to acknowledge that there are a number of different aspects of the social housing debate that this legislation doesn't cover. It doesn't cover the whole question, of course, of future supply, and we'll have an opportunity to debate that in this House in weeks and months to come. It's also important to stress that uh, the overwhelming majority of those who work in social housing are doing a fantastic job. The overwhelming majority of those who work in housing associations, um, in all of the arms length management organisations that help to provide social housing, are people who are dedicated professionals. Uh, and uh, they have nothing to fear from this legislation, indeed everything to gain. But it is the case that we do have a situation where some 13 per cent of homes in the social rented sector do not meet the decent homes standard, um, and that is simply too high a figure. Um, and we need to make sure that action is taken to deal with that. I should say, by way of contrast, the number of homes in the private rented sector estimated not to meet that standard is 21 per cent which is why legislation in order to improve conditions in the private rented sector is so important. And again, the work of my honourable friend, the member for Walsall North and others, is so critical. Um, we have um, in this bill uh, a series of steps that are taken in order to ensure that we can more effectively regulate the sector. Uh, the first thing that the bill does is that it makes sure that what's been called the serious detriment test no longer applies. In the past, it was the case that there was a very, very high bar that had to be met before the regulator could investigate complaints. 
we are removing that test, lowering the bar, making it easier for tenants to feel that their concerns are being investigated. The second significant measure is that we are ensuring that the cap on fines that the regulator hitherto operated under, just £5,000.